682. Let's go ahead and get started, 682. Let's go ahead and stand if you would, 682. <coughs> Guide me, oh, thou great Jehovah, and you can see him up here instead of John. John's over there on the piano, and unfortunately Denise is under the weather this morning, so appreciate you praying for her. But, and I appreciate John filling in, and of course Joyce over here faithfully, we appreciate her too. So let's go ahead and sing together number 682, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Let's sing. Guide me, O Thou Great Jehovah, pilgrim through this talk in military terms, but they're not talking about 
taking up physical weapons or guns or swords or physical armor, but we put on what? The whole armor of God. In fact, if you look at the top of the page up here, it has a passage from Ephesians, which is about the armor of God. So that's Christian soldiers. We take on the spiritual armor of God. We, we do war through prayer and through witnessing and through studying and reading God's word. So think of that in these terms as we sing. Let's sing on the fourth. Fierce may be the conflict. Here we go. Fierce may be the conflict. Strong may be the Thank you. 
high for me, especially if someone wants to reach that high G, help yourself. So you might be confused in this song because when you get to the chorus, there's words on top of each other. My attitude is take your pick because I kind of go back and forth when I sing it so you can take your pick. Uh, I love the, the, I want you to pay attention to the words of these songs. That's why I bring them out. And I like the, uh, in the chorus, it's talking about the grace of Jesus, the wonderful grace of Jesus. That is God's grace. That's something you do not deserve. It's his unmerited favor. It's his grace that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And I like the phrase there, broader than the scope of my transgressions. God's grace is broader than the scope of your transgressions. And the scope of our sin is very wide. The scope of our sin runs very deep. The scope of our sin runs very high, but far broader is the scope of his grace. Where sin abounded, John? Grace much more abounded. Grace much more abounded. His grace abounds far more. Let's sing on the last as the men will be coming forward for this this morning's offering. Let's sing Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Here we go. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most in power, by his controlling power, making God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven.
uh, but I appreciate you praying for her. She has a fever. Uh, and then, of course, no evening service tonight. And there's no midweek service this week. So on Wednesday, those keep that in mind. No midweek Bible study prayer meeting. That doesn't mean you can't pray. You should be praying, but no service, no meeting here this week. Uh, Sunday, March 31st, uh, which is next Sunday, we'll observe the Lord's Supper during the evening service. During the evening service. And then Sunday, April 7th, uh, missionaries, which there are pictures here in the bulletin, and you'll see it again up here. Uh, Randy and Linda Perkins will be with us in Sunday school and during the morning service. And I think I mentioned last week, well, it's actually here in the bulletin. In the bulletin. We have supported the Perkins since 1974, which I really didn't realize how long we had supported them until I went in their file and I saw that we had supported them since 1974. So that was pretty amazing. So uh, continue to pray for them and that God would continue to give them the faithfulness uh, that he's allowed them to have on um, in Australia and now also in Vietnam. They're kind of going back and forth to some ministries in Vietnam. And I'm sure they'll tell us a lot about that when they come. A blessing the neighbor's meal on April 11th. Uh, Saturday, April 13th is another men's fellowship prayer breakfast. And then April 21st, really late this year, is Easter. So, uh, April 21st is Easter. All right, so let me go ahead and get this on. So what I thought I would do this morning is, I don't want to take too much time doing this either. I'm just going to go through it fairly quick. But I know it's on the back of your bulletin. If you look on the back of the bulletin, you can see the list of the missionaries. I don't have them in that order. I, I don't think I did. I, I kind of tried to do it in order of alphabetically according to country, but I might have messed that up too, So or continent or something. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of introduce, or not introduce, maybe reintroduce, re-familiarize you with the missionaries that we support at Fellowship Baptist Church. We support each one of these missionaries at $90 per month. And, and in the bulletin on the back, it kind of tells you how much we sort of would like to come in as extra missions giving over and above your regular offering. And, and that enables us to support these missions, along with what we take out of uh, our general fund budget each month. So, uh, but it comes to a little over $1,000 a month uh, to support each one of these missionaries. So um, hopefully this is going to work. And now, it's, uh, there it goes. Okay. So the first one, as I mentioned, which this is the same thing that's in your bulletin, are Randy and Lynn Perkins. And they are in Lynn or Linda. Did I get that wrong? It's Linda, isn't it? Someone help me. Look on your bulletin. What is it? It's Linda. It's Linda, right. There's a Lynn that we support, but it's Linda. I got that wrong there. The scores. And the Kalanises is Lynn as well. So, yeah. Uh, one too many Lynns here. It's Randy and Linda Perkins, and they're in Australia. Uh, at one point in time, they left Australia and went to Czechoslovakia, but they ended up going back to Australia, and now they're also reaching up into Vietnam as well. And then one of the other missionaries that we support is Jake and Sharon and Hannah Weed, and they're in Bolivia, which is in South America, and we've supported them for quite some time, a little bit longer than I've been here. I think we, the church took on the weeds just before I uh, became pastor here, so we've, I think we've been supporting them a little longer than that, and that's been 18 years, I guess, at least, or probably 20-some years that we've Church has supported the Weebs down in Bolivia, and uh, they also run a couple of different ministries. One is a Bible college for uh, Bible college students, a small Bible college, and that is connected with other missionaries in Bolivia that are involved in that Bible college. And then they also run an orphanage for girls called uh, Miami Home for Girls. And strangely enough, that orphanage was started by a Christian woman missionary from Japan. That's why it's called Miami Home for Girls. So a Japanese woman went to Bolivia to start an orphanage, and it's still going on uh, through the weeds and their ministry. And then the next one is Jerry and Kristen Hickey, and they're in Brazil. The church also supported them for quite some time. And they're in, I think, their third church plant. And their son, who is in Mexico, is coming from Mexico to pastor a church in Brazil. Uh, and, and one of the things that Brother Hickey shared with us in a recent 
missionary letter is there have been people who have fled Venezuela. You know, you've probably heard the news, all the terrible things going on in Venezuela. Families that have fled Venezuela that are now in their church or in their son's church. And, and one of the great things is he's able to minister to them because he's like an expert in Spanish. And he speaks Portuguese, so he's able to help them because in Portugal, or in, excuse me, in Brazil they speak Portuguese. So these people are coming over, and he's able to help them with with the language barrier. So and he's ministering to them. And then uh, Bruce and Donna Cook. These are missionaries that used to be the Heaths that were in Jackson were the closest missionaries to us, but now it's Bruce and Donna Cook. They're in Sarnia, Ontario, and it's just across the border, uh, over in Sarnia. So pray, continue to pray for Bruce and Donna Cook. They've been here many times, and it's one of the things that's aided that is they're not that far away. We visited them, my wife and I, and actually took a group up there from the church years ago to help them give out tracts and uh, New Testaments into their community. Uh, so Bruce and Donna Cook have been a real special blessing to me, as, as all of our missionaries have. Wilhelm and Sandra Falk, another missionary the church has supported for many years, and the Falks have been faithful in Germany. That's a hard road to plow in Germany. They're plotters, and they've been plotting that, and they have an international ministry because they're in Munich, and they have so many people in their church that are from all kinds of different countries, and they're running into a lot of people, actually, that are migrants from Africa that they've been able to give the gospel to, and some that they've led to the Lord. And then uh, John and Patty Summer, uh, we've taken them on since I have been here. And uh, John and Patty are in Ghana, West Africa. And I don't have the names of all their kids up there. And we've, we've had them here on a number of occasions because their home base is here in Michigan when they come back from the field. And they're always a blessing as well. And Patty, actually, my connection to Patty is, uh, and Dave, you remember this, we took a, my youth group took a mission trip over to Ireland, and at that time, Dave was a missionary in Ireland, and Patty kind of came from another church and came along with us, so it was a, a great pleasure for me when I found out she was going to the mission field for our church. Uh, Romans chapter 10, and you may remember last week, and I want to mention this before we get into today's message, is... I, I, we looked at a verse, a verse 3 actually, they're ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And I used an illustration during the course of the message when we're looking at that, about someone who is really zealous about something, and yet they go the opposite direction of where that something is, and does anyone remember what the illustration was about? Anyone remember? That's a beating around the bush, isn't it? I said, someone pulls out of the driveway and instead of turning right, they make a left and they're going the opposite direction of? What was their destination? Pizza Hut, pizza Hut right. <laughs> their destination, they were really zealous about Pizza Hut. You remember that? And they pull out of the driveway and instead of going towards Pizza Hut, they go in the opposite direction. And I got up here to the pulpit this morning to get ready and there was a gift card for Pizza Hut up here. So I will be using a lot of food illustrations and restaurant illustrations in future messages. So get ready for that. Let's see. Outback Steakhouse. Here I come. <laughs> Josiah, can you do me a favor and turn this off up here? It's on. The, the, it's the, it's, Bob, Bob, you're going to have to do it. The, the overhead projector is still on. I know it's not showing up here, but I can still see the light on. There you go, you got it. All right, thank you. All right, Romans chapter 10. And you're there in Romans chapter 10, and I told you to get there, but now I'm going to tell you to go to another verse. But keep your page saved there in Romans 10. And then I want you to go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Because what I thought I would do is I want to give you a couple of verses that, really one verse, but we're going to look at two. And both of them are important that really are a great commentary on Romans chapter 10. A in fact, something you should learn early in your Christian life, hopefully, is that the best commentary on Scripture is the Scripture itself. That's not to say that there aren't some useful books out there that can help us and aid us in studying the Bible. I use them and I like them. But if you really want to be able to understand Scripture, the best 
commentary on scripture is the scripture itself. So what's a good way to understand or summarize, if you will, Romans chapter 10? And I think a good summary of Romans chapter 10 is John chapter 1 and verses 11 and 12. So look with me to John 1 verse 11 and 12. It says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for your word today. I pray that you would, Lord, give us a great understanding of this passage of scripture. Help us to know the truth of it, the truth that fits with your word and your plan. But Lord, also I pray that you'd help us to be encouraged and, and motivated and and have a greater desire to get the gospel to lost people. Get the gospel to people that need to hear. And Lord, help us to be faithful witnesses. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day they'd place their faith alone in Jesus Christ to save them. We love you and praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what makes this a good commentary on Romans chapter 10? You can turn back to Romans chapter 10 if you'd like. The verse there in verse 11 says, He came unto his own, but his own received him not. Jesus came as the Messiah to the Jewish people. He came not to destroy the law and the prophets, Jesus said. I came not to destroy the law, but to what? To fulfill it. Yet, even though Christ fulfilled it, instead of receiving Jesus readily... By and large, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, rejected Jesus as the Messiah and even went so far as to see, along with the Romans, it wasn't just the Jewish people, but along with the Romans, to see that Jesus was crucified, was executed really. But without even realizing it, this also played a part or was part or is God's plan. In fact, it says that in Acts, he was delivered up by the determinant counsel of God. So Jesus, it was in God's plan that Jesus would be crucified so that he could pay the price for all of our sin so that those that could place their faith in Jesus as we saw in, in John chapter 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So after Jesus was crucified and rose again from the dead, and as we learn in Acts chapter 1, he ascended up to the heavens to the Father. Then the next thing that happened, the Holy Spirit came down upon the believers, came down upon the apostles, and they went out and preached, and primarily they preached to the Jewish people at first. And in Acts chapter 2, we're told that 3,000 Jewish people trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior in one day. And that was right there in Israel. And those people were from all over the then known world. It says they were from all kinds of nations. They were there on a specific feast day. They were there to celebrate the feast days uh, of, of the Jewish people. But that success in Israel was very short-lived. There came a period of persecution to the Jerusalem church, to the Jerusalem Christians, and they ended up being scattered and going out in every different direction. And then eventually the gospel went to the Gentiles. I want you to turn now, I know I'm keeping you in Romans chapter 10, but I want you to turn to Acts chapter 13. And we looked at this passage some time ago, but I just want to briefly look at it to illustrate this point or to demonstrate this point. Acts chapter 13, and <clears throat> we're going to just look at a few verses. But what happens, beginning in verse 13, basically Paul goes into a synagogue, and he preaches the gospel in Acts chapter 13. He preaches Christ in that synagogue. He proves, as it says in Acts chapter 11, he goes into the synagogue, and he opens and alleges and reasons that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's what he does here in this synagogue in Acts chapter 13. But how did the people respond to Paul's preaching? Look at verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So there were some, there was a number of Jewish people that responded to this message of the Apostle Paul and received Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as their Savior, trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. 
But then look at verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. That's he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They were rejecting the message of the gospel. They were rejecting Paul's preaching about Jesus being the Messiah. And then verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, to the Jews, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 10. So you see that illustrated there. You see John chapter 1 illustrated in or demonstrated in, in Acts chapter 13. Jesus came to the Jewish people as their Messiah in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. He was born of a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem and the list goes on. But yet they rejected him as their Messiah. And then after Jesus died, was buried, rose again, ascended up to the Father, the Holy Spirit came down and the apostles and Christians began to preach powerfully the message of the gospel in amongst the Jews. Then they rejected him again. And in Acts chapter 13, Paul says, we now turn to the Gentiles. And he turns to the Gentiles. And that is what Romans chapter 10 is really all about. That's the main purpose. That's the main message of Paul. So my goal will be simple here in this chapter today. I want to attempt to accomplish three things. One, I want us to get the overall message of the chapter, which I sort of laid out to you already. And number two, I want you to properly understand some verses in the context of the chapter. And that doesn't mean you don't already understand them. But my point being this morning that many of these verses we know from chapter 10, we know out of their context. Doesn't mean we don't know the truth of those verses, but we're under, our understanding might be, fall a little bit short because we don't know them in their context. So that's the second thing I want to do. And the third thing is, I want to make a, contemporarily, a contemporary application of these verses. I want to apply them to our day because I think they can be and should be applied to our day. So number one, the main purpose and point of this chapter is this, and this is number one, to show Israel's rejection of God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. To show Israel's rejection of God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the main purpose of this chapter. Now there's some verses in here that you and I are very familiar with. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him to the dead, thou shalt be saved. Those verses are, and those truths of those verses are not diminished in any way by the main purpose of this chapter. But let me show you in reading two verses in this chapter to illustrate my point. Look at verse 1. I want to compare verse 1, the first verse of the chapter, with the last verse of the chapter. So you say, well, then that must be kind of the main point. There's the opening and there's the conclusion. Look at verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. That's the first verse. Now look at the last verse, verse 21. But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Do you see it? Do you see the purpose there? Paul opens with, boy, I would really like Israel to be saved. My prayer is that Israel would be saved. In fact, in the last chapter, Paul said, I wish, if it were possible, I wish I could be accursed so that Israel could be saved, although it's not possible. And then at the end of the chapter, the Lord says, I've reached out my hands all day long unto a disobedient and gainsaying or rejecting, strifeful, stiff-necked people. Paul has been awakened to the truth of Jesus as Messiah. You remember that story in Acts chapter 9. Paul's walking on the road to Damascus and he meets Jesus Christ. And what's the very next words out of Paul's mouth? He says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He, he bows on his knees. He's, he's driven to his knees to submit and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as his Messiah and his, his Savior. And Paul would love nothing more than to see other Jews 
his brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. In fact, in chapter 9, in verses 1 through 3, it says this, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Is there anybody in your life that you would be able to say that about? That's a tough statement right there. But I hope we have some sort of burden for the lost as Paul has expressed in this passage. So Paul's desire in seeing those people saved. But Paul's desire, which is huge. The fact that Paul says, I would be willing to be a curse. It's a huge desire. But Paul's desire is nothing in comparison to God's offer. It's nothing in comparing to God's offer. What was God's offer of salvation to the Jewish people. He sent his own son. But even more than that, flip back to 9, chapter 9, and verses 4 and 5 with me. Chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Who are the Israelites? Verses 4 of chapter 9. To whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promise promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came. So what is this a list? What is the purpose of this list? The purpose of this list of things is to demonstrate all that God has done for his, his people, for his chosen people, the Jews. He gave them the law. He gave them the fathers. He made covenants with them. And through them, he had chosen through their lineage, the Messiah would come. But after all that, they still rejected. In Romans chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, but Paul pointed out another advantage. In Romans 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, What advantage then hath the Jew? What profit is there of circumcision? And Paul answers that question, Much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles or the word of God. When Paul opened in, in Romans chapter 1 with this message to the Romans, he said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. So the gospel first came to the Jews. The gospel, Jesus himself was born into the Jews as a Jew. And then after Jesus died and was buried and rose again, the message of the gospel first came to the Jews. Paul's desire is strong and God's offer is unmeasurable. The unspeakable gift. But their rejection is strong. Their rejection is strong. And that's expressed as we've already seen in Romans chapter 10 and verse 21. But to Israel he saith all day long, I've stretched forth my hands. What, 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 what did God stretch forth his hands with? He stretched forth his hands with his mercy. He stretched forth his hands with his grace. He stretched forth his hands with his love. He stretched forth his hands with his son. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He stretched forth Jesus Christ. But he stretched forth his hands to a disobedient and gainsaying or strifeful, stiff-necked people. Jesus said this, I read this verse back in, I think I read it back in Sunday school. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together. This is Jesus talking about the Jewish people. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings. I saw a video not too long ago. I have 22 chickens, 21 or 22. Sometimes some come up missing and they come back. <laughs> but but I don't, we don't hatch any eggs. But, but I saw a video the other day where a guy says, I got to show you something in my chicken coop. And he reached in and he lifted up the chicken and there was a litter of kittens underneath the chicken in the chicken coop. <laughs> I mean, that's a loving chicken right there, sitting on those chickens, keeping them warm. Uh, but that's, that's the, the nature of a chicken is to pr be protective and bring those chicks onto her. And that's what Jesus says, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. This, that's first point. The first point is, this, the purpose of this passage is to demonstrate Israel's rejection. And the second point is this. Can they say 
not enough information. That's point number two. Can they say not enough information? And we can apply this as I would like to apply it to our, t our day as well, but can they say it's too hard to understand? Can they say it's too complicated? Can they say the pieces don't fit together? Can they say, I just don't get it? Now they can say those things, but they say those things in vain and they say those things in the face of God reaching out in love, mercy, and grace with Jesus Christ. I've pointed this verse out numerous times, but it, to me it's one of the simplest verses in the Bible. You ever have someone say, well, that Bible, you can't understand it. Oh, it was translated over thousands of years and, it's, and they just give you all these different things about you just can't understand it. Well, listen to this verse. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 says this. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. What have I pointed out numerous times over the years about that verse? One syllable words. The entire verse. I don't know if it's the only verse in the Bible. It's, uh, I, it's probably not the only verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. No, that's two syllable words. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, there might be another verse that has one syllable words and I'm not going to say that it's the only one. But man, when you're talking about the gospel, that is the simplest presentation of the gospel. If you have the Son, you have eternal life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have eternal life. It's as simple as that. It doesn't get much more simple than that. Well, Romans chapter 10, look at verse 5. This is, what, this is what they're trying to say. For Moses describeth the righteousness which of the law, the man which doeth them shall live in them. But the righteousness of faith speaketh on this wise, and this is what not, this is the not, Say not in mine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Let's, they, what they're saying is to make it as complicated as possible. No, that's not the righteous by faith. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Meaning it's simple. It's right there in front of you. It's on the tip of your tongue. And that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The next kind of part of that, this is still under number two, but there'll be some that have never heard. There'll be some that have never heard. Won't there? Do you know, the only people I ever hear make that argument are people that have heard. But what about the people who have never heard? The only people I ever hear make that argument is the people that have heard. Keep in mind that this message of these verses in its context is to the Jewish people. The Jewish people who have heard. They have the Old Testament. They have the covenants. They have the promises. They have the promise of the Messiah. They have the prophetic promises about the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled. Look at, look at uh, well, in fact, don't look at it. Well, let me flip down to it. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. I had some other verses, but for sake of time, I won't bring those into the mix. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of, of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And those things are all true. And we can apply those to the missionaries that we just talked about. We need to take people, we need to send people. People do need to hear. But in the context of this passage, that's really not what he's saying. He's really saying the opposite in this passage. Let's read on. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? And what's the answer? Yes, they've heard. What did they do with what they've heard? They rejected it. They rejected it. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. 
But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that, that asked not after me. In other words, this goes back to Acts chapter 13. It's, it's demonstrated in Acts 13. The ones that should have known, the Jewish people, the ones that Paul made the connections. What did Paul do when he went into those synagogues? Did he preach out of the book of Romans? Did he preach out of the gospel of John? No, they weren't there. They weren't available to him. He preached out of the Old Testament. And he took passages like Isaiah chapter 53 and he preached out of it. And he took multitudes of other passages from the Old Testament to prove that Jesus is the Christ. And he said, you've heard, but what have you done? You've continued to reject. Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 16. Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? This is a passage Paul is quoting that would have been very familiar to the Jewish people. Who hath believed our report? Do you know what the next phrase says? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isn't that interesting? That the last verse of this chapter in Romans says, he's reached out his hand, his arm. Does anyone know what Isaiah chapter 53 is all about? It's an Old Testament passage written hundreds of years before Jesus was born that describes the crucifixion of Christ. Let me just read a couple of verses from Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And that chapter goes on. It's all, it's clearly all about the crucified Savior. That he would be wounded for our transgressions. So what is Romans chapter 10 about? Romans chapter 10 is that God has reached out with the gospel to the Jewish people. God has reached out with the Old Testament fulfilled prophecies about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, to the Jewish people. And what happened? But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Let me go to number three in the few minutes that I have left. And here's the question I have for number three. Can we apply this passage to our day or is it just to be directed towards the Jewish people? And I would say the answer to that is yes, we can apply it to our days. In the context, Paul is showing us, Romans, the message of Romans chapter 10 is the rejection of Jesus Christ by his people. He came unto his own and he, his own received him not. But look at verses 19. Look at verse 19. It says, But I say, did not Israel know? Yes, the answer is yes. But first Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them who are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. See, just as much as the cross was not an accident, okay, you might think, wow, what's God going to do? He sent down Jesus and they crucified him. Boy, he's got to come up with a new plan. I know what God thought up in heaven. I'll raise him from the dead. Is that the way it ought? No. It was, God's, it was in, God's, in God's eternal plan that Jesus would be crucified and risen again from the dead. Well, just as much it was in God's eternal plan that the Jewish people would reject Jesus Christ. And we see that here. He's, who's he quoting? He's quoting Moses. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. And he says it's going to come a day, basically, that you're going to be provoked to jealousy by a people, by a foolish nation, I will anger you. He's talking about the Gentiles that would readily receive Jesus Christ as Savior, many of them, by the multitudes, by the bucket loads. Verse 20, but Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. And was made manifest unto them, unto them that asked not after me. So the simple answer to that question again is yes. Yes. Chapter 10 has a very simple message to all people. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Look at verse 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. John chapter 10 verse 11. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So the message of the gospel is to all people. And the second part of that is, the message is to all people. People do need to hear. And we can take those verses in John chapter 10 and verse 14 and you've probably heard them preach this way. And I have no problem with them being preached this way. About the, the, these verses are used to say, hey, we need to send people out there or we need to go out there and give the gospel to people. And that is true. That's not necessarily the purpose of those verses in this passage. The purpose of those verses in this passage is to say, yes, they have heard. But guess what? People still do need to hear. People still do need to be sent out to give the gospel. Look at verses 14 and 15. How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now that message of grace came to the Jewish people in the person of Jesus Christ. They did hear and they said no. And because, but these are still true today. We need to witness. There are people that still do need to hear. There's places in this world that need a gospel witness. And we need to support missionaries in that process. But I'll make another application of this. We live in a country, and there's a lot of places in the world like this, where the gospel is prolific. I'm not saying everyone's heard. I'm not saying we Christians in the United States don't need to witness. Don't take that the wrong way. We do need to witness. We need to get the gospel out to people. But many people have heard. Many people have heard the verses I just read to you. Many, many have heard John 3.16. Many have heard verses that we might call the Romans road. And yet, where do they stand? In rejection. They're still going about to establish their own righteousness. They're still part of a works-based religion. Might be under the guise of Christianity, but they don't believe they're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. They believe it's saved. Oh yeah, a little faith, but you gotta be a good person. You gotta work your way a little bit so that you can be worthy of God's grace. That's not the gospel. But yet the gospel's clear. He that has the Son has life. He that doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. And many people have heard and they're going to hear the same message to them. All day long I've reached out my hand to a disobedient and gainsaying people. They stand in rejection. So let me close with three things this morning. Number one, three encouragements to you. Number one, read the Bible with understanding. Read the Bible with understanding. That would be one encouragement to you. Read the Bible. That would be one big encouragement to you. And read it and meditate upon it and seek to understand the word of God. The Bible was never intended to be a source for bumper stickers. The Bible was never intended to be a source for memes on the internet. The Bible was never intended to be a source for cross-stitch patterns. Am I saying you shouldn't do any of those things? No. But to some, that's the extent of their study of the word of God. And we need to understand the Bible in its, in its context. So read, my encouragement to you is read and study with understanding. Do I always get it right? Absolutely not. But I want to be someone who studies and reads the Bible. Number two, recognize that God is merciful and long-suffering. Recognize that God is merciful and long-suffering. The fact that you and I get to hear the gospel once is an unbelievable demonstration of God's mercy. And many here, we've probably heard it thousands of times. And there's many who still stand in rejection, maybe even some here today, who've not come to faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And yet God has allowed you to hear the gospel over and over and over again. 
God is merciful. He's long-suffering. He may let you hear it a thousand times more. But we can see in Scripture, God's mercy, the Bible says, does endure forever. But we even see God at times puts limits on his mercy and his long-suffering. There's an end to God's mercy and, and his long-suffering in allowing you to hear the gospel. And that may come. Don't be that disobedient and strifeful rejecter. Receive Jesus Christ today. The third thing I think this passage should encourage us to do today is get the gospel out to people. Whenever, whatever way you can. If it's through a bumper sticker, more power to you. If it's through a gospel track, it's through it handing out New Testaments. If it's through putting money in the offering plate so the missionary like Eris Alfonso can go into that remote village and get the gospel out or in Ghana, West Africa or in Brazil or wherever, then do that. If it's talking to your coworker about Jesus, then do that. You say, man, pastor, it's too complicated. No, just say this. Say, did you know there's a verse in the Bible that's made up of all one syllable words? You ever hear someone say how complicated the Bible is? Just say this to somebody. Say, do you know there's a verse in the Bible that's all one syllable words? And give them 1 John 5, 12, I think it was. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Pretty simple, isn't it? Let's pray. God, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the message of the gospel. We're thankful for your mercy, God. Lord, I know I personally was not worthy of your mercy, was not worthy of your grace. Broad was the scope of my transgressions. Broad. But Lord, we're thankful that still broader, still wider, still deeper is your grace. And God, we give you glory for it. And God, I pray that as Christians, we wouldn't just come to a club where we talk about things, but we'd come into a church where we leave this church body, this local church body, and go out and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Give to them the message of the gospel, that if they just place simple faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, none of their works, none of their religion, but alone in Jesus Christ as Savior, they can be eternally saved. God, help us to preach that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again unto salvation, and that if people simply place their faith alone in him, they can be eternally saved from sin, death, and hell. God, I pray that you help us to be faithful with the message of the gospel. And I pray if there's someone here today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord, they wouldn't let another day go by in rejection, but simply place their faith in Jesus. Just admit and confess that they're a sinner and that they're lost without hope. And Lord, just place their simple faith and pray and ask you to save them through what Jesus Christ did on the cross and that they could be eternally saved and, not have to, and know that they have eternal life. God, be thankful for the way in which you work. Help us to be faithful. Give us the strength, God. We need it. We need your help. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast of Fellowship Baptist Church. We are located on 41 North Bedford Road in the Urbandale section of Battle Creek. The times of our services are Sunday school at 10 a.m., Sunday morning worship service at 11 a.m., and Sunday evening services at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evening services at 7 p.m. We have a potluck supper on every fourth Sunday with no evening service on that particular Sunday. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and you're always welcome at Fellowship Baptist Church. Your voice, your community.